Unplugged, Chapter 21, Jet Baranoff. People are ostriches, Vlad always says. When they don't like the world around them, they bury their heads in the sand so they don't have to do anything about it. My father has never met Grace or Terrell, but he's got the two of them pegged perfectly. I kind of forgive Terrell. Seeing his father fall apart like that had to be a nasty shock. But what's Grace's excuse? She's such a cheerleader for this wellness freak show that anything against the place has to be a rotten lie. To her, meditation is the greatest thing since sliced bread. She'll never accept the fact that Ivory is using it to brainwash customers into writing big checks to Friends of the Oasis. Most important, what is Friends of the Oasis? That's the big question. Is it a real charity? If so, then it's definitely different from the Wellness Center, which is an actual registered business that charges its customers for the privilege of coming here to be starved to death and bored stiff. But people give to charity out of the goodness of their hearts. They don't have to be brainwashed into doing it. Charity or no, something smells. Ivory is either a crook or a psycho, probably a little bit of both. And what about Nimbus? He's the big tofu around here. Is he in on this? Or is he just the doofus who's too clueless to see what his number two is doing right under his nose? Only one way to find out. I'm going to pay a visit to the cottage of Magnus Fellini. And he's leading the awakening, one. making half-asleep kids do jumping jacks. That's where I tell Matt I'm going when I head out first thing in the morning with my trusty lock-picking paper clips. Like Ivory, Nimbus lives in a regular cottage, number six. He doesn't even have a special sign or symbol on the door. That's how modest he is. Although the welcome mat says, be whole. What does that even mean anymore? Maybe give your whole life savings to friends of the Oasis? As I'm breaking in, the first thing I notice is I didn't have to. The door isn't locked. I step inside, ready for anything. If Ivory had a cell phone and evening gowns, this place could be decked out like a gangster's penthouse with racks of cash, gold bricks stacked everywhere, and a couple of Tommy guns in the, in the umbrella stand. I don't see that. Instead, I see the same modest carpeting and furniture that's in all the cottages. Oh, yeah, I see one more thing. Sitting at the table, eating a bowl of muesli and drinking juice is Brooklyn Feldman. I'm so caught off guard that my first thought is, what a coincidence, we both broke in at the same time. But who breaks into a cottage just to have breakfast? Goldilocks, maybe? Nobody else. We stare at each other in shock for what seems like forever. Finally, she speaks. Okay, so now you know. Honestly, I don't know anything, so I keep my mouth shut, hoping she'll explain. How did you figure it out, she asked. I keep bluffing. It was kind of obvious, she shrugged. After all these years, you're the only one who's ever learned the truth. And that's when it hits me. She's barefoot, wearing shorts and a tank top she's probably slept in. She lives here. The way people admire Magnus is almost too much, she goes on. Like he's a guru or a wizard or something like that. I thought it would be weird if it got around that he's my dad. Her dad? Nimbus is her father. I'm not sure why I'm so shocked. Everybody's father has to be somebody. Look who mine is. Your name is Feldman, not Fellini, I blurt. A smile tugs at the corner of her mouth. So is his. He's Magnus Feldman? Try Marvin, she tells me. But Marvin Feldman doesn't sound like the name of a guy you'd follow to a remote wellness center where you kiss the world goodbye and devote yourself to exercise, health, and meditation. The name change was my mother's idea. She's here too? Just how many secrets does his family have? Brooklyn shakes her head sadly. She couldn't handle the lifestyle. She married a stockbroker, and when he turned into a pathfinder, she couldn't hack it. That's why I come to the Oasis every summer. It's not vacation. It's joint custody. I almost relate to that. My folks aren't divorced, but my mom is crisscrossing the globe for orthodontists without borders three quarters of the time. And sure, she does it because she loves helping people, but I'll bet some of her motivation isn't totally different from Brooklyn's mom. It's probably even tougher being Mrs. Vladimir Baranoff than being Mrs. Nimbus Fellini, even if the food's better. I'm astonished, but I probably shouldn't be. Brooklyn always knew things about the Oasis that she had no business knowing, like where the boat was docked and where to find the key for it. And the shed where we kept needles? Brooklyn was the one who first showed it to Grace. There had to have been at least a dozen times when she said something that made me pull up and think, 
How would a normal guest get a piece of info like that? Now I have my answer. She's not a normal guest. Her father owns the place. More than that, he's Captain Hole, the wellness superhero who dreamed up the entire thing. Why did you lie to us, I demand. She flushes a little, but doesn't, but doesn't back down. I didn't lie. I never said Magnus wasn't my father, and I never said my father was somebody else. I just avoided the subject. That's baloney, and you know it, I accuse her. Five minutes doesn't go by in this place before your dad's name comes up. I complain about him. Grace never shuts up about how great he is. When we were hiding needles and taking the boats to Hedge Apple, whose rules did we talk about breaking? You had a million opportunities to fess up, a million chances to say, funny coincidence about that guy Nimbus, but you didn't. Why? Are you spying for him? I feel my eyes narrowing. Did you tell Ivory about the candy bars? She's appalled. Never! I love hanging out with you guys and looking after needles, and the hedge apple trips were great, including the food. This has been my best summer ever. That didn't stop you from dropping us like a hot potato the minute needles was out of the picture, I charged. I dropped you? You dropped me. You got mad. Grace got defensive. Terrell got weird. What was I supposed to do? I was always the outsider in the group. She leaps up from her chair and faces me. If I had told Dad about needles, don't you think the Pathfinders would have shut us down? Or if I ratted you out about Hedge Apple, don't you think the launch would have been moved someplace you couldn't find it? Maybe all that was going to happen, I counter. But you were biding our, your time piling up the evidence. She stares at me. This is a wellness center, not a cop show. I admit I covered up who dad, my daddy is. I wanted to be treated like everybody else. And you know what? I was right. Look how you're treating me now that you know. I'm speechless, but only because my head is spinning. The nerve of this girl lying to us and then making it seem like it's all our fault for getting mad at her when we find out. Worse, this runs all my plans. How can I search the cottage with her standing here glaring at me? Which means I have no way of finding out if Nimbus is in on Ivory's scam. And I don't dare tell Brooklyn what I know because for sure she would run straight to her father. I'm dead in the water. I backpedal out for, of the cottage. Forget you ever knew me, she says. My pleasure, and slams the door in my face. Grace once told me that in the original plan for the Oasis, there were no doors at all. Before you can be whole, Nimbus flops if you went, you first have to be open. I consider shouting that to Brooklyn, but as Nimbus's kid, I'm sure she already knows. The cramps are back, and no wonder it's been days since my last candy bar, and more than a week since I've been to Hedge Apple for real food. I sit in the di dining hall, glaring at, a Brussels, at Brussels sprouts in my plate. If I swallow one more veggie, the gas in my stomach will expand, and I'll float off the ground like the Hindenburg and probably end up the same way in a fire explosion. You're not eating, Matt reminds me from across the table. These days, he's spending so much time meditating that the fake incense smell clings to his clothes. He's tucking into one of those world-famous Oasis veggie burgers, which tastes a lot like pretend meat, smacking his lips like he's never experienced anything so delicious. It might even be true. If Ivory can brainwash him into donating big bucks to friends of the Oasis, maybe she can convince him that the rabbit food they serve here is gourmet stuff. I frown. Sounds like a joke, but there's nothing funny about it. What Ivory can do to unsuspecting people is some kind of mind control. I should know. She almost did it to me, and it was pretty scary. Scarier still is the fact that she's using it to separate people from their money. Where's Miss Meditation today, I ask. Ivory usually holds court from the front table in the dining hall, sitting so tall in her chair that her shiny dome of crew-cut platinum hair commands the room like a star atop a Christmas tree. Watching the adults line up, hoping for a smile or a nod is pretty nauseating, and that says something in this building. She's off tonight, Matt replies reverently. She works so hard, and she's so devoted. Right, devoted to ripping off people. The frustrating part is, I'm the only one who knows what she's doing, and I can't make anybody believe me. Not Grace, not even Terrell, who sees it happening. And Brooklyn? Yeah, right. Like I can tell Nimbus's daughter. Her dear old dad could be Ivory's partner or even the brains of the outfit. Maybe he's the one who split that $90 porterhouse with her. The thought of Pathfinders gorging on steak while the rest of us gas up on Oasis Chow is the straw that breaks the camel's back. I leap to my feet, overturning my chair. I, 
I'm not hungry, I stammer for Matt's benefit. I exit the dining hall via the longest strides I've ever taken. I already know where I'm going before the door closes behind me. There are real burgers out there just a couple of miles upriver. When I head for the boat, I'm running. As I make my way through the woods along the saline, I, a terrible thought haunts me. What if the launch isn't there? What if our conversation before got Brooklyn so upset that she blabbed her dad about everything we've, done, we've been doing? But no, there it is, bobbing at the small dock. And I check, the key is still in the knot hole under the loose board. As I putt-putt into the river, I start to relax a little. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing, but I'm positive it's the right thing for me. If I had to watch Matt take one more bite of that veggie patty, I would have popped a blood vessel. I feel the vibration of the boat's engine struggling against the current and ease up on the throttle a little. The way my luck has been going these days, I'll burn out the small motor and be stranded on the, in the mighty sea lane until I drifted into the Gulf of Mexico. About halfway to Hedge Apple, I spot the bike Brooklyn and I noticed on our previous trip. Has it been there all this time? It's not like Ivory to lose track of one of her fleet of Oasis bicycles. Or maybe this isn't the same bike. I think it's leaning against a different tree. At the bend of the river where the town of Hedge Apple first comes into view, something totally unexpected happens. I'm aware of the corners of my mouth turning upward. I'm smiling. It makes no sense. There's absolutely nothing positive about my life right now. I'm in wellness Alcatraz. Needles flew the coop. My friends hate me. And Matt along with every other adult, is under the spell of a meditation marvel villain. There's zero to be happy about, but for some reason, chugging into this untown feels like coming home. Or maybe it's the prospect of a real hamburger that's boosting my mood. What could be more uplifting to a starving person than gas pains? Maybe I should get the steak. I reach into the pocket of my shorts. I've only got 12 bucks. The downfall of my candy business has taken its toll on my finances. Okay, no steak, but that burger is going to be epic. I'm so anxious that I just about take out the dock, but no harm done. The launch bounces off a row of tires protecting the wood. On the rebound, I manage to lasso a pylon and get tied up. Now, the most grace, not the most graceful arrival, but I'm here. I choose the barbecue place over the greasy spoon because the menu describes their burgers as half pounders. It's a nice night, cool for Arkansas in July. So after I place my order, I sit down at an outside table. I'm chilling there trying to smell my cooking burger through the smoke coming out of the kitchen vent when I hear the roar of an engine that could only belong to one vehicle in this town. The black Ferrari 488 Spider drives slowly down Main Street, pauses at Hedge Apple's one and only stop sign, eases gently around the corner, and takes off up the road with a shriek of fine-tuned acceleration. Snapper! I crane my neck to catch a glimpse of him, but the car is already moving away at dizzying speeds. Doesn't matter, his destination is obvious, the mansion. I'm torn in two. I know where he's headed. I know how to get there. He's mine. But my burger, it's coming. It'll be ready any minute. One thing decides for me. This could be my only chance to solve the puzzle of the mystery billionaire gangster mogul recluse who built such a fabulous home and chose Hedge Apple as the best place to put it. I'm starting for the road when the waitress's voice reaches me. Hey, do you want your dinner? She carries a plate, my burger in the center, surrounded by a mountain of fries. Can I get that to go? 30 seconds later, I'm jogging along the road, my $12 spent, my dinner in a styrofoam takeout container in the crook of of my arm like a football. As I run, the food smells rise into my nostrils, torturing me. I don't dare stop for a few bites, though. The mansion isn't far from town, but it isn't exactly close either. If I fill myself up, I slow myself down. I'll eat you later, I promise the container. Job one is to find out what's the deal with Snapper. About halfway out to the mansion, the pavement ends and the road changes to gravel and then dirt. But by this time, I bathed in sweat and gasping for breath. So much for the cool day. There is no such thing as cool when you're running cross-country carrying something you would trade a kidney to be able to stop and eat. I'm making progress. I'm close enough to spot the Ferrari parked on the circular drive. Good. He's still there. I also noticed a couple of figures hanging around outside. Snapper's employees, goons, would be a better word. I can't let them see me. That's going to be tricky if I want to get up close. 
The good news is my timing is perfect. The shadows are lengthening as the sun hits the horizon. Dusk will help me stay out of sight. The only cover around the house is along the river bank, not woods exactly, but an o- overgrowth of stunted trees and tall reeds. Another weird thing about this place, in California, people pay millions of dollars extra for a water view. Here, Snapper's got one, the saline, but he doesn't even bother clearing the brush away so he can see it. I'm about 50 yards from the side of the house. I have to cover most of that dif- distance crawling on my belly through tall grass and weeds. The ground is a little soft, and the front of my Behold t-shirt is getting smeared with mud. This would be a lot easier if I wasn't carrying my dinner, but I refuse to let it go after dragging it so far. Then I'm behind the house, out of the sight line of those two goons. I scramble to my feet and start peering in, wi- in, peering in windows. I'm no interior decorator, but I'm barren off enough to recognize quality stuff when I see it. Fine woods, expensive upholstery, fancy accessories, art pieces on pedestals, and paintings on the wall. Snapper's taste of luxury extends beyond his house and his car. Stealthily, I progress from window to window, an elegant parlor, a library, a plush office, a formal dining room. As I move on to the, mo- to the modern kitchen, my feet step from gr- soft ground onto some kind of wood platform. A deck. I look down at the fading light. If so, it has to be the crummiest deck in the history of deck making. There's no furniture, no barbecue, no umbrellas or tiki torches, no fire pit, just cheap, unpainted plywood in patchwork pattern. To top it all off, it has what I can only describe as a swamp view, marshy mud and shallow pools of dirty water leading all the way down to the river. Strangest of all, there's a wire fence straight out of a POW camp movie. It stretches clear out to the saline where there's a padlock gate. It's mind-blowing. Why would anybody build an ultimate mansion, furnish it with the ultimate stuff, and then do the backyard an 18th century outhouse? It even smells bad. Not outhouse bad, but there's definitely something ripe out around here. I reach to the kitchen window just in time to see one of the goons walking into the gleaming tile floor. Startled, I jump back from the class to avoid being noticed, only to find that I've stepped over out over the edge. I wave the go-to container in front of me in a desperate attempt to regain my balance, but it's no use. I tumble off the platform and fall five feet straight down into a muddy pool. The splashing goes on a lot longer than I expected. Since it's getting dark, it takes me a moment to figure out that it's not all me. If I don't drop dead on the spot, I'm probably going to live forever. The deck isn't a deck at all. It's a roof covering a pit. And that pit is filled with, no joke, alligators. Real ones. A lot of them. Big, small, all sizes. My heart, already pounding from my spill, starts hammering hard enough to burst out of my chest. I can catch my breath no matter how many gulps of air I suck in. Calm down, Jet. It only makes it worse if you panic. I struggle to take stock. The animals seem to be afraid of me at first. The feeling is definitely mutual. Alligators. Nimbus never said anything about alligators in the Saline River, at least not this far north. The largest of the gators, who must be 15 feet long, is crawling in my direction. I have a brief giddy vision of how sorry Vlad is going to be that he sent me to this awful place where he hears I've been eaten by an alligator. Then it hits me that he'll probably never find out about that. I'm, I'll just disappear. That's what happens when someone who goes up against a platoon of gators armed, armed with nothing but a styrofoam container. Wait a minute. I open the box and look at the burger and fries. I'm not totally unarmed. I have something to trade for my life. The big gator opens a mouth straight out of every kid's prehistoric nightmare. With a flick of the wrist, I dump my dinner into his gaping maw, wheel on a dime, and I am up and over the fence like a champion vaulter. Or maybe I didn't vault at all. Maybe I flew. Anything is possible. Squatting on the muddy ground, hyperventilating with effort and relief, I reflect on the situation. Alligators. I still have trouble believing it. Of all the weird things about a very weird house has to be take has to take the trophy and since there are no alligators around here at least not what I've seen does that mean these animals are pets on second look the enclosure is gigantic it extends all the way to the far side of the mansion and it's writhing with creatures there must be hundreds of them 
Keeping a pet alligator is bizarre enough, but hundreds? It's almost completely dark now, but that's when light dawns. No, not pets, livestock. This is an alligator farm. It makes sense. What kind of person ends up with a nickname like Snapper? A guy whose business is raising and selling alligators. As I watch the big gator's jaws clamp shut, when they open again, my dinner is gone. I'm not upset because that could easily have been me. It's the best $12 I've ever spent. A big lunk head moves out of the way, and I spot what looks like an inflatable kiddie pool in a small fenced area. Sitting on a cushioning of straw are 25 or 30 bright white eggs the size of extra large chicken eggs. There's something moving in there, and I stare in amazement as Needles comes marching on top of the shells and stops with his front legs up against the wall of the kiddie pool. How did Needles get all the way over here? I'm horrified. The poor little guy won't even last 10 seconds with all these hungry alligators. I'm frozen to the spot. I don't dare back in there to rescue him. Even if I didn't know, didn't want to become gator chow, I can't even call out a forewarning for fear that the snapper and his goons might hear me. Then something crazy happens. A second needle squirms up to purchase inside the first, and a few seconds later, a third. I'm thunderstruck. Which one is the real needles? The answer comes pretty quickly. A cascade of answers, really. Number one, none of these is needles. None of these three is needles. Two, these are baby alligators. Three, needles is a baby alligator, too. It all fits. The leathery skin, the needle-like teeth that gave him his name, the limitless appetite for meat. Needles must have hatched here, slipped through the fence, washed down river, and blundered onto Oasis' property. No wonder he didn't eat the vegetarian slop from the dining hall. What self-respecting alligator would touch that stuff? No wonder he used to stand in the paint tray submerged up to his nostrils. He was waiting for prey, like crocodilians have been doing for tens of millions of years. Turn on Animal Planet, and sooner or later, you'll see a gator doing exactly that. Wait till I tell Terrell and the girls. Then I remember, we're not really friends anymore. If we were ever. My jaw stiffens. All the more reason to tell them now. To rub it in that I figured it out. And they didn't. And they never would have either. At least not until Needles was eight feet long and chewing on their heads. The thought of the others back at the Oasis reminds me of an urgent matter. I'm where I shouldn't be behind enemy lines. Finally, I've solved the mystery of why Snapper built his mansion in the middle of nowhere. This is an illegal alligator farm. No one is supposed to find out about it. If Snapper and his goons catch a kid sculling around their secret operation, I'm in big trouble. It wasn't that hard to get here, but now I have to find my way back to Hedgeapple, pick up the boat, and pilot downriver to the oasis all in the dark. As soon as I stop shaking from what almost happened to me, I scamper to the edge of the house, drop on my belly, and begin to crawl through the underbrush. At least the darkness makes it easier to stay hidden, but I can't get careless. This is a dangerous place. My heart freezes as a sudden glare illuminates the tall grass and I brush and brush around me. I swivel toward the house, half expecting to see flashlights pointed my way and goons running to capture me. It's the halogen headlights of the Ferrari in the circular drive. One of the men holds the driver's door open for the elusive snapper. As the big boss slips in behind the wheel, I catch a quick glimpse of facial features passing through the glow of the dome light. For a moment, I forget how to breathe. The truth flattens me like a meteor strike. It's the last person I expect to be the owner of a Ferrari, a mansion, and a secret alligator farm. And that's not all. Snapper isn't even a he. He's a she. Ivory. How can a meditation teacher from a wellness center afford a setup like this and, te- and a team of tall, burly employees to run it for her? The thought is barely fully forming in my brain before I have the answer. It comes to me with the memory of a zipper pouch filled with donation checks. Of course. I always knew Friends of the Oasis wasn't a real charity, but in my wildest nightmares, I couldn't have imagined a scheme like this. Brainwashed Oasis guests are donating the money to run Ivory's alligator farm, and in turn, The profits from the farm are supplying Snapper with fancy dresses, pricey steaks, sports cars, and a high-end house that would impress even Vlad. 
I have a vision, a lone bicycle stashed in the woods just north of the oasis. Sure, Ivory pedaled out on the bike, but pretty soon she swapped that for a much sweeter ride. For a fleeting moment, I have to fight down the urge to leap to my feet, get right in Ivory's face and holler. You're busted, you big creep. Cook, you might be able to put this over on everybody else, but you can't fool me. That would be the old me, though. The one who flew drones over San Francisco Airport and ordered a Dance Dance Revolution machine to the backwoods of Arkansas. And as much as I tell myself I do crazy, impulsive things because I have courage and attitude and rebellion up the wazoo, the real reason is I know Vlad will always come to my rescue. I stayed down with my face in the dirt. Maybe I've changed in my time at the Oasis, or maybe it's just obvious that if Ivory catches me here, it's not going to be the kind of trouble my father can get me out of. So I eat dirt until the car is gone, and the goons have rumbled their way back into the mansion. Only then do I abandon my cover and run for Hedge Apple. This time, I feel no breathless, no exhaustion as I sprint along the dirt road. I'm powered by pure adrenaline. I could run to California if I had to. I'm moving so fast that it's almost a shock how quickly I'm back in town. When I pass the barbecue place, it hits me that I am starving. I never got any dinner. Then I remember what happened to my dinner and keep on running. I don't stop until I'm in the boat, putt-putting downriver, peering out past the cone of light from the launch's single headlight.